Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very exciting uh, hour, which is the graduation le lecture of Leke. Um, and before I start, I just want to perhaps both introduce Leke as well as provide some context for what we've been doing over the last six months. And um, well, the first thing is I, I'd just like to introduce myself. So my name is Sarah Hooker and I'm a researcher at Google Brain. I also founded Delta Analytics um, seven going on eight years ago. Uh, and it's very exciting to be at this graduation lecture because in many ways, uh, this is a very exciting chapter in Delta's efforts. Uh, Delta's mission is to increase access and usefulness of data to empower change makers working to better their communities. And we do this through two ways. So one is our data service program where we partner with nonprofits all over the world and we pair them with data scientists, researchers uh, to help uh, work on questions that have impact. And the other is our mission to empower educators all over the world to do good and to teach in their communities. And uh, we've done a lot. <laughs> so since 2013, we've completed 50 projects. Uh, we've recruited 200 data professionals to volunteer. And the most important for us is that we've charged zero dollars for our services. And uh, really, today is about the Teaching Fellows. So the Teaching Fellow program started uh, in 2017. And the goal was we wanted to not only bridge the technical skill gap with the data program, but actually create long-term solutions of building local capacity. And our key initiatives is that we taught our pilot program in Nairobi, Kenya. And then we also subsequently taught in Morocco and the Bay Area. Um, and we further improved our curriculum in 2019. But in 2020, we really wanted to remove ourselves as a blocker. And we really wanted to instead support educators all over the world. Uh, and one of those educators is here today, uh, Leke. Um, so this uh, is just some of the people that uh, were involved in helping prepare the program. Um, and uh, these are the stories. <laughs> so this is uh, essentially who I'm super excited to support today. Uh, uh, Leke uh, has spent the last six months uh, really uh, growing his craft as an educator. And so uh, it's a privilege to be here to introduce him because I, I'm really, uh, I've both learned a lot from him uh, in, in our mentorship over the last six months. Um, and to give you some context about Leke, uh, so he is a machine learning engineer at Data Science Nigeria. He believes in the power of communities and is an advocate for lifelong learning. His favorite topic in machine learning is computer vision because it is a field that will shape the way computers and artificial intelligence systems see our world and human related impact. It is a field that brings AI from its exclusive world of running on clouds and chips to an inclusive world of humans and interactions. And Leke, it looks like people are very excited to see you. We already have a comment saying, hi, Leke. <laughs> so uh, this is gonna be a very exciting hour and feel free to interact and engage as we go through the lecture. Um, but without further ado, to our professor of today, uh, Leke, welcome and uh, feel free take it away. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And for me, it has been a uh, privilege of working with Delta Analytics over these six months of learning how to teach and communicate my ideas better. So uh, welcome to my graduation lecture. Uh, so today, uh, the topic for my graduation lecture is Generative Adversary Network. And some of the outline for this course I'll be talking about uh, my motivation, why I'm interested in this field in generative, generative adversary network. Then we'll be moving on to some of the basic knowledge, some of the things you should know in this field. And, and then I'll be talking about some of the state of the art research work that have been done by researchers all over the world on this topic. Okay, so my motivation. So why am I interested in this field? So for me, I see generative adversary network as GAN, I see it as a form of art. And uh, when it comes to Africa, Africa has a lot of different art forms, the way we dance, the way we, our clothes, our health style. But you only see few, data, uh, you see few African data sets being used uh, for research, especially in GAN, 
even the machine learning, you see few. And I think GAN is a way in which you can help us to bridge this gap because with GAN also we can generate data sets. And if these data sets are, are good enough, they can be used uh, to do further research. So come along with me and then I would try as much as possible to uh, raise your interest in this field and see how we can shape uh, African uh, image and this field together. So uh, GAN is a very recent breakthrough. Uh, he started in 2014 uh, with uh, Goodfellow and his colleagues. So there have been different kind of generative uh, model before, but GAN, which is generative adversary network, is very, very recent. And it was uh, decided in 2014. So I'm going to show you some pictures, and I want to uh, I want uh, to see whether this GAN network can fool you, whether you can get fooled by this network. So I want you to pick between one, two, and three, which one do you think are real images and which one do you think are generated images? That one's fake. Real images are images of real people, right? Generated images are images created by the computer, by an artificial intelligence, by a model. So which one is real? That's a real person. And which one was created by a model, OK? So can I see your answer in the comments? OK. Is one real? Is two real? I'll be looking at the comments and pull across the correct answer. So courage, everyone, make a guess. <laughs> OK. OK. Someone say two. Is two the fake or the real one? OK. Everyone mentioned two. Maybe two is the real. Someone feel like two is the real one. Someone is saying, uh, okay, yeah, two is real. Is there any other person? Okay, I think uh, let, let's move on. So actually, they are all fake images. They are all generated by a GAN network. That's to show you how, so, uh, how interesting this field is. All these images were created by artificial intelligence model, and none of them are images of real person at all. So that's what GAN can do. So GAN, you can, uh, GAN can be illustrated with this short story, with the story of the counterfeiter. The counterfeiter is someone that is trying as much as possible to create free currency and a cop. A cop is the one checking, okay, is this currency real? Is it fake? And then the, the counterfeiter is trying as much as possible, trying his best to make sure to, uh, to, to make sure to uh, deceive the cop or to fool the cop by developing him or herself. And then the cop also is trying his or her best to make sure not to get fooled by the counterfeiter. And because of this constant competition between them, the counterfeiter is always improving. And then the cops are always also going for training seminars to make sure that, okay, what are the new skills all these people are using? What are the new techniques they are using to make sure that they don't get fooled by the counterfeiter? And this is what GAN is. It's about bringing two models together and making them compete to bring out the best. So in GAN, we have two models. We have the uh, newer network. We have two newer network working within a GAN. We are, and this newer network are both competing within a uh, uh, within game theory in the form of zero-sum game. So what I mean by zero-sum game is that there's always a winner and there's always a loser. So in uh, in the aspect of football, there's always a winner and then there's always a loser. In zero-sum game, there's no draw. So uh, between the uh, two uh, models, one must win and one must lose. So Gans, remember, two models, one of the models is trying to predict which one is fake and which one is real. And that model, you can illustrate it to the cop in the image I showed you before, checking the currency to see, okay, which one is a fake uh, currency and which one is a real currency. And in GAN, we have a model like that called the generator, or the discriminator, trying to predict to see, okay, which of these data set that we shown to me is the real and which one is the fake. And when I mean the fake, the one generated by the generator. And 
the goal here is by making these two model compete, you can come up with two good models, one which is good as creating fake data and the other which is also good as the distinguishing between fake and real data. So that's just the basic introduction and I've told you why I care about it. And so why should you also care about this field, especially for researchers in Africa? So GAN is a form of art. Uh, that's for me, it's, it's just a form of, GAN has plenty of real life use case when it comes to image generation, that's for generation also. GAN can enhance the quality of an image. I'll be showing you some of this particular use case. And GAN can also generate image based on a given text. So you can just type within your phone and say, uh, generate an image of a uh, cat, and then GAN will be able to understand that text and and generate uh, those images. And you can even give it more complex text and it will be able to generate an image that illustrates what you are trying to achieve. So here are some of the uh, images created by GAN over time. So uh, in 2014, when GAN started, that was the first image generated by GAN. And over time, you can see 2012, 16, 17, and year is 2018. And you can see how GAN have improved over time. And with these uh, great details put into GAN, you can also help uh, if these images are realistic enough to be able to fool you, man, just the way the, the first one I showed you fooled you. GAN, this data set can also be merged with real data set to build more uh, for research purposes and things like that. And also GAN can be used to bring famous portraits to life. It can also create fake, deep fake videos of uh, celebrities saying uh, something they didn't see and things like that. And also GAN can generate uh, animation model also. Uh, I, like I said before, GAN can also improve the, the uh, image resolution of an image, like you can see here. This is a blue resolution image and then GAN can fill it in with, uh, with the, uh, filling the missing uh, pieces within the pixel to get very high resolution, uh, resolution image. So the only use case I've seen of GAN for African work is uh, the work done by Victor Idaba. And uh, what he did was he generated uh, Max African Max, he collected uh, a lot of uh, African Max and then trained it on GAN to generate different art form. And you can see how GAN were able to learn these pictures and generate uh, Max that are very realistic and very detailed in a sense. So you can check out the work with this link. Also, uh, some of the very huge potential of GAN, especially in an African setting, the more you can use the soft data scarcity, like I've said before. If the uh, images, if the data generated by GAN become very realistic, you can use you can use those images and for research also, and you can join them with the uh, real images you have and use them for research. And this can really solve the data scarcity that we have in uh, Africa instead of uh, a, a upcoming African researcher training a model to distinguish between a dog or a cat, you can train it to distinguish between different kind of African dresses and things like that. So this can really help. We can generate different clothes design for African dresses also. So we can generate a new dance steps also. African likes to dance a lot. But all of us, we can train a gang that can do this. Also, we can generate new melody based on African instruments and we can see, imagine a gun playing a talking drum for, the, for those of you familiar with talking drum. And this can, this can actually, uh, th this can be a very nice research, research area to work on. So, okay, let's see again whether you can get food by a gun. So uh, in the comment section, which one, which of these images is real and which one is fake? So let's see whether you can still get full Okay. I'm looking at the comment section. Which one is real and which one is fake? <laughs> People are scared to answer. Don't worry, don't worry. You can. Okay, two is real. Okay, someone, someone is only saying two. I don't know. <laughs> 
Okay. Okay, I'm seeing. <laughs> Someone said Tukui. Tukui is here. Okay, so actually, yeah, so Tukui is you, and that's an image of me. Why do many are fake? All these ones were generated by GANs. So, what that's that's to show you how good GANs can be. And in this lecture, I'll be showing you uh, how to build the GAN and some of the things you need to know. So, check for understanding. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be showing you some questions. And I just want to uh, see whether you guys are following me. Uh, um, okay. So, true or false? Number one, GAN consists of two neural networks, true or false. And number two, also, GAN machine learning framework was defined by a, a good fellow and his colleagues in 1970. So, true or false? True or false? Okay, I also. So, let's see, true or false? So, is number one true? Is the second one false? So, what's the answer here? Yeah? True or false? Okay. Someone say true, false. Okay, okay. Okay, this will show that you guys are actually following me. So, number one is true. So, GAN consists of two models I told you before. And number two is false. So, it was actually in 2015 stroke 14. So, GAN was built. Okay, so I've talked about the motivation, why I'm very much interested in this field and why you should also be. And then I'll be talking about some of the basic knowledge, some of the things you need to know in this field in order to be successful in it. Okay, so like I said before, GAN has two models. The first one is the generator, and the generator is the one creating the fake images it learns to generate plausible data. Generated, uh, the generated instance become negative training examples for the discriminator. So what this means is that the generators create fake data set, and then the discriminator, that's the second model, learn to distinguish between the generator fake data and then from the real data, that's the original data. So the discriminator will be checking, okay, this data that was passed to me, is it real? Is this is it fake? Just like the illustration I gave earlier of the counterfeiter and that of the cop. That number one, the counterfeiter is always trying to outsmart the cop, and uh, so the counterfeiter is the generator creating fake currency. Why the discriminator is the cop checking if the currency is real or fake? So. As I'm explaining this to them, just be using that analogy to, to follow along with me. To follow along with me. So putting everything together, this is how it can, this is the basic architecture of it can. So the generator uh, is there creating fake images, and then the simulator trying to distinguish between the images created, whether they were fake or real. And initially, when the first starts, the both of them are bad at their jobs. So both of them are bad at their job. And if you think about it, if both of them are not bad at their job, starting, then uh, it won't be easier, it won't be easy for them to learn. Let's imagine a counterfeiter is just starting, whether it's first day at the job, and then the cop assigned to catch him is a very uh, is a veteran, 20 years in the job already. Once the counterfeiter creates fake currency, it will be very easy for him to catch, and then he'll spend his, his, his life in prison, and then he will have a career as a counterfeiter. Or imagine you want to learn how to play uh, tennis, and then your first opponent is uh, Samuel Williams, and that's the person you are playing with for like 20 games. She will just be beating you, and then it will be difficult for you to learn uh, with her because she's very good, and then you, you are very bad. But if uh, level two of you are quite similar, and then over time, you guys can go together, then uh, two of you have a career together. And that's what generator and discriminator, that's the idea between a gang. If uh, both of them starting, they are not 
quite good at their jobs and over time through integration then they become better and then that's how you get a very good can so let's the next uh use an example i'll use an example of the counterfeiter but let's try and build a can uh that can successfully generate an image that, that looks like me that looks like lk and yeah the simulator will we try to distribute between generated image and then the real image. Okay, so for the discriminator, how does a discriminator look like? I told you before that the discriminator's basic part is to distinguish between the fake and then the real. And for yeah, whether it's leaky or is not leaky. Not leaky means that the image was generated by a generator. And a discriminator is just your basic classifier for those of you familiar with uh newer network initially so your basic classifier uh it can be a multi-layer perception it can be a convolutional network and all what is just trying to do is with a binary outcome whether yes or no cat or dog and things like that so that's what your uh, discriminator is and the discriminator class is the distribution between the fake and then the generated data by the generator and that's what the discriminator is. And you need two kinds of data to be able to train a discriminator successfully. You need the real data set and then the fake data set. Imagine the, remember the image I showed you before, there's the image of the real money and then the fake money created by the counterfeiter. And also you need a, uh, the real data set, that's the data set from a real event, real people, uh, the distributor use this instance as the positive example during training. And then you need your fake data set, the data set created by the generator. And the distributor uses this instance as a negative example during training. So these two data are together, and then you pass them through a convolution or a multi layer perception. And then it's trying to predict okay, this particular image was generated by a generator, so it's fake. And this one, is from real event, real people, so it's you. So that's that's how you build the discriminator. So for a generator, the generator learns to create fake data set based upon feedbacks from the discriminator. So I told you before that the game these people are playing is called zero sum game. That means there's always a winner and then there's a loser. So after each iteration, then you have your loss function and a feedback loop, and then Based on the feedback, whether the discriminator was successfully fooled by the generator, if the discriminator was successfully fooled by the generator, then the generator is happy that, wow, I fooled the discriminator. And then, but if the discriminator was able to catch the generator and say, okay, wow, this image was actually fake, then the generator will get a ne negative feedback. So, so that's that. So for you to train a generator, for a discriminator, we need to detect Two kind of data form we need the generated and then we need the fake but for a discriminator uh all what you just need you just need a random noise a random gaussian noise the data distribution of the noise does not really matter based on research but based on research we found that the dimensionality of the noise is always lower than the output so what this means is that if you pass a gaussian noise to a generator that has a 32 by 32 pixel. So for those of you that are not familiar with that, just think that it has 32 rows and 32 columns. What a generator will uh, give you as a tool will be something higher, maybe 120 by 120 or 250 by 250 or, uh, but the outcome will be uh, larger than the, than the noise putting. So, so that's that. So let me just integrate over again before we move on, on how to train again. I told you that the, for, the gen, uh, for the decimator, you need two kind of data sets to be able to train. You need the real data and then the fake data, the one generated by the generator. But for a GAN, to be able to train, the input you'll be giving to it is the random version noise. And then for the dimensionality, the data, is, uh, the distribution of the noise does not really matter much. Um, but just know that the, out, uh, the output dimension is always greater than the input dimension and things like that. Okay, so how do we train this GAN? 
like I said, training gang is quite taxing because you have to be able to train them uh, sequentially, in a sense, because if your uh, if your discriminator gets too good and is able to detect every output that the generator gives out as fake, then your generator will not be able to learn much. And over time, that will also affect your performance of your discriminator because once your uh, discriminator is able to get uh, all what the generator is giving out as fake, then the discriminator does not need to optimize any of its parameters again. And over time, it will just, it will just stop learning. But if the generator becomes too good, and then the discriminator does not does not catch up, then the generator will be able to fool the discriminator very easily. And the discriminator uh, we have a very best performance, and over time that will affect your generator also because once your generator has successfully fooled the discriminator for a long while, it will stop learning because it will stop getting negative feedbacks <coughs> from the discriminator. And the kind of loss function that successfully captures it, that captures what we are trying to do and how we are trying to train again, uh, is this um, minimax function. So the minimax function here is the loss function in which the original GAN paper are used. And uh, over the next slides, I'll be breaking them down and trying to see what was the idea behind this loss function. For some of you looking at this loss function that uh, in a way in which it looks familiar, yes, it looks familiar because uh, it was coded from the cost entropy loss function, uh, cost entropy function for those of you familiar with machine learning initially. So remember it is a game, zero sum game. The generator is trying to fool the discriminator and then the discriminator is trying not to get fooled by the, the generator. And for every integration, one of them was win. It's like the generator wins and successfully fool the discriminator, or the discriminator catches the tricks of the generator and tells this generator, no, you're not fooling me this time. This is actually fit, and things like that. Okay. So to simplify the function, let's remove the uh the e, the e stands for. Sorry, okay. Yeah. The supply function, let's remove the need, the instance for the expected value, and let's just remove the minimize gain and just let's focus on this function, the log of d into x plus the log of one minus d into bracket g of z. So uh, d of z of x is the discriminator estimation, please note, of the probability that the real data instance is real. So I want you to take two things from here. Number one, I know that is an estimation. I know, also know that is a probability. Since we are dealing with probability, know that probability range from zero to one also. And G of Z is the generator as put when giving a noise Z. So our noise that I told you that in which we used to train the generator is Z, that's Z. And then the real data is x, just, just note that one in a sense. So g of z is the outcome of uh, when the noise has been passed through the generator. g of z is what will come out. So that's the output of the generator. g of z is the output of the generator. And d into bracket g of z is the discriminator estimate of the probability that the fake instance is new. So what this means is after the output of the generator, and then it is now passed through the discriminator to predict whether it is real or fake. The outcome of that one is what we call G at D into bracket G of Z. So the first one, D into bracket G of X, that's the probability that the real data instance, that means the discriminator successfully predicts that X is real and G of Z is the outcome from our generator after we pass in the noise and D into bracket G of Z is this discrimination prediction of the outcome from the generator. So I've explained those functions and I've broken them down to you. So don't worry, we'll, we'll look into this function 
more detail than we'll be able to see uh, what's the issue and things like that. Okay. Uh, so we are still, so now let's add the minimum, uh, the mean and the max. So remember, this is the game. The, uh, the generator is trying to minimize this function. Why the decimator is trying to maximize the function? So that's what mean of G and max of D means. So the generator is trying to minimize this function and why the uh, decimator is trying to maximize this loss function. I remember again, this is a game. One of them, <laughs> we have to win over time. One of them will win over time. And is it that the uh, generator wins or the discriminator wins? So is it that the generator successfully minimizing that function or the discriminator successfully maximizing this function? So like I told you before, D of X, this is the probability. So the value will be expecting from D of X will range from zero to one. And range from zero to one. And zero means that the input data in which the discriminator was given is fake. Y one means that the input data in which the, uh, the discriminator was given is real. Please note that. But it can be between zero to one. We can have 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, is the probability. But since for, for all of those that are familiar with probability, probability can only range from zero to one, nothing else outside that value. By the value of G, the back Z can be between zero and one also. And for zero, zero means that the generator was unable to fool the dissimulator. That's for this, for this value over here. And for one, okay. And for one, one equals that the generator successfully fooled the discriminator. So if we have one here, that means the generator was successfully fooling the discriminator. And if we have one here, that means the, uh, the input data given to the discriminator was one, uh, was was zero. So let's let, let's show this function inside the graph and see. I switch. So let's take the first one, the log of D into bracket X. So uh, if you look at this graph, so this is the uh, graph of the log of D into X, and this is the curve. This is the curve. And we are talking about the discriminator phase. So that's why you're already seeing maximum here, max of D. Uh, that's why you're already seeing maximum here, max of D. And that's what uh we are trying to do and then let's take the other function that's log of one minus dx remember we are talking about the discriminator that's why we're only putting max of d and so this is the curve of the log of one minus d into bracket g of z the log of one minus d into bracket g of z okay so let's try to maximize this so What's the maximum point for this? The maximum point for this would be yeah. The maximum point for this curve would be yeah. Because remember, I told you that because uh, it's a probability function, we are only considering between zero and one for d of x. And so all these other points will not be considered because we are only talking about probability. And so to maximize this function for this particular log of d to x, d of x must be one. And remember I told you, one means that the data is real. The data is real, is real. So D of X must be one. And to maximize the other one, this log one minus D into bracket G of Z. Remember the curve is the other way around. So the maximum point of that curve will be zero, since we are considering only zero to one again. And for this, D into bracket G of Z, not be equal to zero. And that one means that the generator was not successful in fooling the discriminator. Imagine, remember that the, uh, this, uh, the discriminator is trying to maximize this function. And that's how it maximizes the function, by not getting fooled by the discriminator, by making sure that the value that is coming out, out of this function is equal to zero. And then the value that is coming out of this is equal to one. 
that's how that's how a that's how a discriminator maximizes the function. So let's talk about the generator. The discriminator is trying to maximize the function. The generator is trying to minimize this function. Since there is no parameter of g here, so the generator cannot minimize this function. So we'll be removing this log d of g out. So we we'll only be having log one minus d of g into bracket z in order for the, the generator to minimize this function. Please follow me. So to minimize this function, the, out, uh, the output from this must be one. And yeah, if you can see, uh, if you can see to successfully minimize this function, must have one here. One must be here. So g of g of z must be equal to one in order for us to successfully minimize this function. Um, because that's the minimum of this function. So we bring everything together. So that's that's what uh, the loss function is trying to do. It's trying to, number one, minimize uh, one aspect and trying to maximize one other aspect also. Um, in, in bringing everything together, uh, in case now you are seeing, you just start for the expected value of the X, that's the new data into log g of x and expected value of z uh, that's the generated data into log one minus d of g of z and so that's that's what the loss function is trying to do and different researchers have come up with different other different log function uh in order to achieve better outcomes than this but this was the log function that was originally used in the initial uh, GAN paper that, that was done by Good Fellow. And uh, that's why it was called Generative Adversary Network. They are adversary. One is trying to minimize, while the other one is trying to maximize at the same time. And only one of these uh, models can win. This is that the discriminator successfully maximized this function or the generator successfully minimize this function. And also you have to remember again that to train them, one must not get so good while the others get so bad. Even if they are adversaries, they have to be equal rivalry within them. If they are not even good than the other, then your model will collapse and you will get a very good outcome. As, they are, as the discriminator is getting very good, the generator must up his game and try to uh, fool the discriminator. And once the discriminator sees that, okay, I'm getting fooled a lot by the generator, the discriminator must also up, up his game, tune some parameters and make sure that uh, he, can, uh, he can beat the generator also. So, so that's the end for that. Uh, uh, check for for the uh, introduction to GAN for the basic knowledge. So I'll do some check for understanding also again to make sure that you guys are following because I'm sure I talked about some quite a lot number of maths over there. So so that so the first one is the simulator creates fake data. Is that true or is that false? The second is. The input of a generator is a random noise. Is that true or is that false? And the third is the negative example. During trainings are real examples. Is that true or false? Okay, so let me see your answer in the comments. Does the simulator create fake data? Hmm? Which, which of the models create the fake data? Is it the discriminator? Okay. Okay. So number two, the input of a generator is a random noise. Is that true or is that false? And then number two, we, the negative example doing trainings are real examples. Is that true or is that false? Okay. 
Okay, so actually the discriminator does not create the fake data. The discriminator is the one checking if the data is given or not. The generator actually creates the fake data. And then number two is that the input of the generator is the random noise, that's true. And number three, negative example during chains are real examples. That's false. The negative example during chaining are the fake examples, the generated examples on the uh, generator. The positive uh, examples are the real examples. Okay, so that's that on checking for on checking for understanding for this. So uh, moving on to the final part of this lecture, I'll be talking about the state of the art of the research, state of the art research work. These are some of the research works that they are, they are, that are up to date that are showing. Okay. These are some of the uh, research works that are done by researchers over time, and then they have helped to improve this field uh, also. So uh, the first paper we'll be talking about today is the original GAN model. Um, that was the one that we've talked about over time. Uh, and uh, it was done by Goodfellows and his colleagues and what they were just trying to prove on the data is also show that this kind of uh, way of training a, uh, gen a generative model was actually viable, was actually good. And we can see this based on some of the output they were able to create. Um, but they used a uh, 32 by 32 image. And then the GAN model was able to learn and generate some really pretty convincing data. It was able to uh, generates images of faces and also digit also that were not in the original data set that was used for training and this was this but for the uh, generator and discriminator they didn't use uh, they didn't use any convolutional network they used purely uh, multi-layer uh, multi-layer perception uh, network and that was how they were able to build the uh, discriminator and also for the generator, also multi layer perception network. And that's how they were able to build the generator. Okay. So, bringing the two together, they were able to create a GAN model. Okay, the second paper that I will be sharing also with you is the conditional GAN. And what the conditional GAN tries to do was to make sure that. Instead of the generator generating those random images over time, however, if it, if it can input a categorical ID, a value Y into it, and then we can uh, condition the generator to generate a particular type of image within a particular time. So now, if I input one into the generator, I can say, okay, one can stand for generate image of cats, and then the and then the generator can uh, will know that okay now I'm meant to generate image of cat instead of image of a dog, and and that's what uh, conditional GAN tries to do, try to condition the GAN to generate a particular kind of data within a particular time. Okay, so the other one of the models that are also uh, one of the research work that I find it very very interesting is the uh, DC GAN and DC stands for deep convolutional GANs. And what this uh, try to do is try to see how viable it is instead of the uh, generator and then the discriminator sh uh, should be uh, uh, a multi layer perception. Why don't we use a convolutional network? Since we know that convolutional networks are very effective in bringing out. Uh, in extracting pictures in within image or, or data, uh, within a uh, data set. And that's what uh, DC can try to achieve. And then they made use of batch normalization to, stable, to stabilize learning also. And that's the idea. You can, you can read more about it. 
if you are interested. And again, uh, began. So began is also another interesting research work also that, that is very interesting. And I think you should check out also. And what began strikes to accomplish is also see how viable it is if in case we, we train a GAN on bigger data sets, uh, like the image nets, with the GAN, will it be able to learn uh, all those features based on the complexity of the image and the kind of, uh, and the scale of the image also. And that's what big GAN strikes to achieve. And then they were able to uh, generate very realistic images uh, that, that were even able to fool the human observer also, the image of dogs that are very realistic, generate landscapes also that are very realistic. And this last landscape cannot be found anywhere in the world. And so that's that. And uh, one interesting thing that they tried to do in uh, deep down is instead of making the size of uh, the size of the uh, noise that was passing to the generator uh, constant, they tried to change it over time and see how uh, that affects the, the GAN uh, network. So the last paper I'll be talking about also, so as not to bore you with a lot of research work, is the style GAN. And the style GAN well, was successfully generated by the realistic face images. And also they designed the generator architecture in a way that adds partial pixels noise at each layer. So instead of just adding the noise uh, at the first stage, just like an input layer for the generator, they added the noise within different layers of the pixel. And then it was able to, they also did some very interesting things. So you can read the paper, they're able to generate very realistic images of faces of people that didn't exist anywhere in the world. And the GAN was able to generate image and also understand uh, smile. Well, now you can see this image, this person is smiling and things like that. And a GAN, the artificial intelligence can also can understand what a smile is and, uh, and all those things. So this is quite interesting. You should, you should check it out also. So uh, thanks for coming to my graduation lecture. So, uh, is there any question? Okay. If you have any question, you can just put it uh, in the comment section. Okay, so let me just... Okay, let me just move on and if there's any... Okay. So thank you so much, Loke, for an amazing lecture. As we wait for questions, I want to ask you a few questions, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't make sure it's not I, I, I will. I'll, I'll temper it. <laughs> but I actually want to ask you a personal question, which is okay. how has the what has been your favorite part of the last six months? Uh, what have you enjoyed? And what has been your low? Okay, okay. So my favorite part uh, will actually be uh, meeting with the uh, with the uh, teaching fellows, my colleagues, and trying to uh, uh, understand their own point of view and see how in a sense they see machine learning and the difficulties they are trying to face and accomplish. Because most of the time we talk about some of the things that scares us when teaching and how we are trying to improve ourselves and things like that. That kind of talk gives you motivation also and make you improve and things like that. And also doing uh, <laughs> some of this part I like also is doing our weekly uh, weekly meeting with Sarah also. She's, <laughs> she's always pushing, like you have to do your slides. Like, <laughs> so uh, that part, I'm always like, wow, I have to do my slides and things like that. So, that kind of motivations are, are quite uh, good for me and I really like it. Uh, for my low, uh, I think for my low would be, uh, would be when I first start, like I did, uh, I didn't expect it to be this taxing, so I just 
I needed to adjust. I remember the first time I say I met, she was so they gave us an assignment and I didn't do it. And then she was like, <laughs> you have to also, you have to, you have to do your assignment and just like that. That's so funny. Um, yeah, I told you, but, I told you to get serious. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But you did. So I think it's a huge accomplishment to see all the effort you've put into this lecture. You've yeah, gotten very yeah. serious, like it. <laughs> um, we have a technical question. So this is from Ahmed, and I think it's related to the question earlier. So earlier, um, Ahmed asked, does that mean that the maximum value the discriminator can have is 0 0.5? Um, so I think for the original paper, it is. For Goodfellow's original paper, right? Yeah. OK, yeah. No, the maximum value a discriminator can have is 1. And uh, it's between 0 and 1, not, uh, not 0 0.5. If you check the curve I showed earlier, so the maximum value was at uh, 1 based on which one you're looking at. So the maximum value can be uh, is one, but the value can range from zero to one. Ah, okay, okay, interesting. So then I think his this probably explains his, uh, the second question, which is what's the maximum value for the discriminator loss, which is the same one. So I think you've answered that in the slides. Mm -hmm. Um, the final question I have is, um, so you mentioned a lot why you chose GANs, being motivated by your interest in art and your desire to bring GANs to generate more data. So you only mentioned one uh, piece of work which is focused on the African context, which is by Victor, the African yeah. mass generation. So yeah. do you plan to uh, either teach students uh, so that they can start their own projects, or if you were to do a project on GANs in the African context, what would you do? Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, talking about me and data science as a whole, we have, uh, is, is one of our passion, and one of the passion of the, the founder, that's Bayou Adekonfi, of making sure that when we are teaching students on how to learn uh, machine learning or things like that, that we are using data set that uh, that they can relate with things they can see, things that are within their environment. And so that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to, as much as possible, create data, uh, collect data from uh, different source. And if that is not possible, so we are looking at uh, training a GAN in order to generate very realistic data. And then we can use this data also in training. So for me, one of the areas we are currently working on is how to generate uh, uh, the cultural addresses, uh, create a gun to generate cultural addresses. And that, oh, are you working on this right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Um, we have a, so I believe, so Delta Shadow, I believe is Melissa, but she has a question for you. She says, what advice do you have for people interested in into ML engineering or people interested in joining Delta? Okay, okay. Uh, if you're interested in joining Delta, please do, <laughs> because you really grow it. Yeah. For me, it's a kind of, it's one of like, one of the best kind of training I've received so far when it comes to teaching machine learning also, because uh, they will teach you some of the concepts you need to know. And also for those people starting in machine learning, just keep trying, uh, keep trying and keep uh, making, uh, doing your best, you, you see a lot of people saying, uh, you need masters, you need PhD, uh, and they, are, they may actually be right based on the areas you want to focus on, but just know your stuff and make sure that you try as much as we to learn from whatever sources you can get, online books, attend conference, read the search papers also, uh, because they'll be helpful also. Uh, and then uh, that reminds me of your quote, which you gave at the beginning of the Delta Fellows, where you said yeah. it, it's something like teaching is one of the best ways of learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've, learned, I've learned more from teaching than from, uh, from uh, sitting down to learn on my own. Uh, I, I think that's one of the really aspects, that's why one of the really aspects I enjoy uh, teaching, because you actually learn more teaching based on from your own personal reading 
and based on the interaction with the people, your students, and things like that. So you learn more teaching from me than from, from any other source. Yeah, it puts the pressure on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. When you're teaching, you've got to be on your top game. Um, yeah. So we have a question here, which is another text, technical question. Uh, so I'm not. So can the loss function be better minimized in a three-dimensional domain where Jacobian Hessian matrix fail? I'm not quite sure. I understand this question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but I know that there are different kind of loss functions that uh, new researchers have tried to bring on. Uh, there is one DKL uh, divergence and things like that. So I, I think maybe it's talking about a different kind of loss function, a different kind of uh, research paper. Yeah, so, but where the Jacobian and the Hessian matrix fail. Um, so the Jacobian and Hessian are all about essentially the second order <laughs> properties of the weights i'm not yeah it uh for for the asker the question maybe more details or we can or like it can follow up as well yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up i'll follow up i'll follow up on you yeah um, okay so let me just end my slides by thanking sarah <laughs> you've been you've been a very great motivation uh throughout this past six months uh, your work ethics is supreme. Uh, my, my passion is when I grow up, I want to be like you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you are the best, actually. And I also want to thank uh, uh, this uh, particular wonderful people that uh, sat down with me to help me review my slides and make sure uh, that is up to standard, uh, up to date, giving me suggestion from Roberto, Rosanna, Sacha, they are wonderful people. Quite humble people. <laughs> when you see their CV, you'll be surprised, but they really take time to, to listen to you and uh, correct with love. That, that's why I wonder for me. And so that's that for, for, for the GAN. And also, if, in case you would like to partner, you're working on something interesting in GAN, especially within the African context, you can send me an email or send me a tweet on Twitter at uh, lake at gmail lake your day at gmail.com and i'll be and if you have any more questions also you can you can you can send it to me also. okay uh, thank you lake for all your work putting this together and congratulations on your graduation lecture yeah. <laughs> extremely successful you did amazing over the last six months and it's been a privilege to work with you so thank you so much and thank you too. thank you also for taking the time out as you have a busy schedule working with google to to mentor your fools that are just starting it's it's quite for me to be talking with sega almost every saturday is quite <laughs> Yeah. Well, you've shown you're quite serious. You put a lot of effort in. So um, anyways, thank you so much. We're going to end the broadcast now, but thank you to everyone who attended. And this happens every Friday. So next Friday, yeah. we have another of Lucky's right. colleagues who will also be giving their graduation lecture. So please come back and help them celebrate because it's a uh, uh, really exciting six months for everyone involved. And uh, again, Leke, enjoy your Friday evening because you deserve it. You put a lot of work in. Now you can go celebrate. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.